And we have also posited as the guide, as the leader of human consciousness in the spiritual growth, the psychic being, the soul, which is different from his nature personality, mental person, vital person, emotional person, physical personality. They are natural personalities precipitated on nature for practical work of life and also to aid in the growth. But they are all egoistic. They are all ruled by a strong sense of egoism. Mental personality is full of mental egoism. Vital personality is full of vital egoism and so on. Whereas the psychic being is the true representative individual in the human consciousness. It is true individuality in the sense that it has no egoism. That it is a representative of the higher consciousness in the lower working of man's ignorant life or ignorant nature. Well, that we will come to when we approach the psychic being. Just now, our first concern is to finish with the sub subconscious with which we are dealing. And one item before I go to Sirundo's important one quotation which is left out is that the common idea current at present about subconscious is that the subconscious rules the nature. That uh, the modern psychology has always emphasized that man is a creature of his subconscious impulse, his subconscious movements. And that the subconscious, because it is below and very wide and great, very powerful and strong, therefore the subconscious governs the nature. Now this is a conclusion which is really uh, fraught with uh, undesirable consequences for man's progress. It is true that the subconscious is there and it is in many cases a greater part of man's consciousness than his outer being, than his external nature. That is true. And it would also try to govern man. But man's human, man's being man or human being, uh, well, we can say, deserving the name of human dignity would require that he should not believe or accept that the subconscious is a governing part of his consciousness. Subconscious is there. It is there also in the animal. And to say that because the subconscious is below our surface consciousness, unknown to us, very powerful, they, and it is the governing uh, you know, part of our psychology, that means to say we are minimizing the importance of intellect, reason, conscience, sense of aesthetics, and power of human will. All the four or five factors which have really contributed to man's progress, we are underrating when we accept that the subconscious is a greater part of man's conscience, which it is true. But man's dignity as a man consists in ruling the subconscious and not being ruled by it. See, that is the position which in yogic life you take up generally. And it is just contrary of many of the, mod not all, but many of the modern schools of psychology. One instance I can give you is a lo long past psychology, which is no longer nowadays so authoritative as it was once believed to be, the psychology of uh, Freud, you see. Now he went on and, and found out one corner of man's subconscious, not the whole of subconscious. And one dark corner of man's subconscious he found out and tried to prove that the whole of human conduct was governed by that subconscious impulse of sex. Now, admitting sex is a powerful element in human life and psychology, it would be childish to believe that subconscious rules the man. It is exactly in proportion that man is able to impose his decision, his understanding, his uh, uh, intellectual reason or his ideal or his control over the impulses, whether conscious or unconscious or subconscious, that he becomes man, that he is entitled to be called cultured. Otherwise, well, he is and, and this is one dangerous part of modern culture that the modern mind puts on a veneer of outer, you know, an aspect of culture, appearance of culture without assimilating or embodying within oneself the true elements of human culture. So as soon as some position or some crisis arises, in which man is challenged 
to create the higher values of his life or live up to it, you find that the venice is gone and the animal is up. Put the man into a critical situation, man who is more progressive and you say cultured and this and that and so on, and uh, immediately you will find that when he has not assimilated the higher values and made them dynamic in his life, well, he has only put on a veneer over the the barbarous or the barbarian in him, and as soon as that is out, the barbarian is always up. That is that is where we see in the most civilized people. That's what the what the people do when when they are faced with uh, with situations in which they have to well bring out what is real in them, and then the, what is there comes out. Therefore, if we accept this. Uh, ruling power of the subconscious, we will be to that extent uh, well, uh, giving up the right of human being uh, to control his whole psychology. That is, that is one sign of man's greatness and man's, man's you know, uh, sign of being cultured, that he is able to impose a discipline either of his mind, of his will, of his uh, you know, values of life, of ethics, or some belief or idealism upon those parts of his nature which are governed mostly by the inconscient, the subconscious, and the, the, the levels which are below his conscious mentality. So admitting the force of the subconscious, it would not be correct on our part to, to assume or to accept that the subconscious is a ruling portion or organ of man's psychology. The ruling parts are the parts that are open to light and not the parts that are hidden in darkness. The business of the parts that are open to light, even intellectual light, moral light, spiritual light, is to shed the light and govern those unlighted or obscure portions by the light, by the help of the light. Guidance must be given to God, but it is the business of men to govern those parts. Well, then, uh, now don't try to go over the portion which we have left uh, you know, unread. The subconscious is not the whole found yes, whole foundation of nature. The nature is not founded on the subconscious. It is only the lower basis of the ignorance and affects mostly the lower vital and the physical exterior consciousness. And these again affect the higher parts of nature. They do affect, but indirectly through the lower parts. While it is well to see what it is and how it acts, it is the subconscious. One must not be too preoccupied with this dark side or this apparent aspect of the instrumental being. And that is the great warning, you see. Because when you take up modern psychology, you always try to look up for the subconscious. Or you must also be trying to look up for the positive, for something that can control the subconscious at the same time. If you only look at the dark spot and dark corner, where you get more and more entangled into it. More and more interested. Oh, there is one subconscious impulse, there is another, there is third, there is fourth, and so on. There will be no end to it. But there is a redeeming power in man, redeeming feature in the higher parts of man is, is a love for the truth, the good, the beautiful, or some aspect of, you know, I mean, um, aesthetics or morality or ethics or something which he can certainly make dynamic in his consciousness instead of fully preoccupy himself with the lower. Uh, you see, with obscurity of nature. One should rather regard it as a something not oneself, a mask of false nature imposed on the true being by ignorance. The true being is the inner being, with all its vast possibilities of reaching and expressing the divine, and especially the inmost being, the soul, the psychic purusha, the true soul entity in man, which is always in essence pure and divine, turn to all that is good, true and beautiful. That is, that aspect also is there, isn't it? So why to concentrate on the one which is uh, confined to obscurity and darkness? The exterior being has to be taken hold of by the inner being and turned into an instrument no longer of the upsurging of ignorant subconscious nature, but of the divine. It is by remembering always that this, always remembering that and opening the nature upwards that the divine consciousness can be reached and descend 
from above into the whole inner and outer existence, mental, vital, physical, and the subconscious and the subliminal, and all that we overtly or secretly are. This should be the main preoccupation to dwell solely on the subconscious and the aspect of imperfection it creates depression, then it creates depression and should be avoided. One has to keep a right balance and stress on the positive side most, recognizing the other but only to reject and to change it. You recognize the subconscious not to accept its working as a ruling power in your consciousness but to reject it and to change it. If you see and study or observe working of the subconscious impulse in you, the attitude must be not that now the subconscious is there, how can I resist? So subconscious will rule in my nature, not that attitude. You have to take the attitude of rejecting it and changing it. Well, then that would be worthy of man's dignity. This and a constant faith and reliance on the mother are what is needed for the transformation that is to come. That uh, takes us to the end of the subconscious as founded by Sherwin. Now I take up this aspect of the psychic being. I gave you the schema which I'll give again for today, I think. It is better I repeat it for once. Yes, we made this. If you take this as a mind or mental being, this as the emotional being, and this as a vital being, then Behind, I am taking the main, of course the physical also is here. All these are turn and this is the psychic being. Psychic being is the sole entity of a true divine spark or true divine individuality and it is behind nature. It is from behind that it is trying to govern the mind, the emotional being, the vital being and the physical being. Well, when it succeeds in consciously coming to the surface and governing the nature part, then Human nature go, undergoes a transformation. Human nature then undergoes a transformation. Transformation of human nature is possible definitively when this psychic entity, which is the sole entity in man, representative of the divine in him, the true individuality, when this part takes up the governance of mind, of emotional being, and of the vital being and physical being, then real transformation begins. And in yoga, practice of yogic life, what one is to do is to awaken this inmost being that is in oneself. The business of yoga is to make one conscious of the psychic being. Aspiration comes from this part, really speaking. Aspiration may take the form of an emotion. Aspiration may take the form of an idea or thought. Aspiration may take the form of will in the vital. But aspiration in its origin springs from the psychic being because it is psychic being that is really open to the higher consciousness to the divine, to the light, to the truth. Now, uh, the Upanishad spoke of this existence of the psychic being as the, the being in the heart or being rather in the cave of the heart. It is the, said, it, uh, what the word said there is dridaye guhayam in the cave of the heart. This being resides in the cave of the heart. Or as Gita puts it, it is the Lord seated, seated in the heart of all creatures. Ishvara Sarva Bhutanam Vritdeshe Tishtati. The Divine Lord seated in the heart of all creatures. That is a psychic being. Psychic being is the sole entity in man representative of the higher consciousness. The true individuality, the true man. Yes, Upanishad spoke of it as the Purusha in the cave of the heart, and Gita spoke of it as the Lord seated in the heart of all creatures. It is not in the heart center in the sense of cardiac center, not on the left side, but it is behind the emotional movement. On the surface are the feelings and ordinary emotions and sentiments which man experiences, they are as it were on the surface of an ocean. But if you go deep into the depth of the ocean, profundity of the ocean, then you come to the existence of the psychic being. Penetrate into the emotional being slowly without disturbing yourself much and without making much 
you know, effort and you will gradually get into the, the cave of the heart, so to say. You will come to the, 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 to the depth of emotional being where the psychic being is, well, centered. It is behind the heart. And it is a soul personality in man. Psychic being most purely manifests the divine in the lower triple nature of man, mental nature, emotional nature, vital nature, and even the fourth physical nature. It is this which is able to bring in the highest element of divine light into human nature. The psychic being is behind the three parts of the lower nature, mind, life, and body. And it has the highest and largest opening to the higher truth. It is automatically open from here to the higher light here. You see, if we admit a higher light to the, if the region of the higher light is here, the psychic being is able to open from here directly to the light. Whereas for the mind, it has to make an effort to make an opening. That is the distinction between the psychic and mental opening. The psychic being has a spontaneous opening to the higher consciousness. It has not to make an effort to reach the truth, to reach the light, reach the supreme consciousness. It, because it represents, it is automatically all the time in contact. The psychic being, well, and its awakening is indispensable for the manifestation of the divine in life. For reaching the divine, well, you can say that you can reach with the mind. Identify yourself with the consciousness that is above mind. But if you want to manifest in life, psychic being is indispensable because mind is not capable of bringing directly the light of the Supreme into life except indirectly or with a distortion, with a coloration added of its own. If the higher consciousness of the divine power or illumination or light is to come into life, it must be through the awakened psychic being because then the light comes without distortion. Light always comes. If you admit and experience the higher consciousness, well, you get something. But what happens is that the ignorant nature retains its basic ignorance and brings in as much of the higher light as possible through that nature. With the result that there is plenty of deformation and distortion in the expression of the light that comes. Well, therein you find difference in the ideals, difference in the manner of manifestation, the ways in which the people who have realized higher consciousness, either how they behave and what they do and how they speak, all that is a, is a realm of manifestation. And in the manifestation, unless the nature is transformed naturally, the manifestation will not be pure and undistorted. It is only when the, the yogi or the, the spiritual person is conscious and consciously brings the higher light into first the psychic being and puts the light into his mental being, there you find in the mind uh, something of a light which is harmonious, which is, which is penetrating, which is illuminating, and which helps the other minds also to open to the same light. It is not an intellectual writing in that case, though it is expressed in terms of intellect. You will see the difference if you know how to distinguish between a pure intellectual stuff and intellectual manifestation of a higher light. This is a, a point of experience. If you try, you will see that it is quite evident for anybody who has experience. When he reads, uh, reads something, he knows, well, this is a man trying to be man trying to be clever. It's all right. You know that he is good. He does a good job, hard work, intellectual uh, labor, and he is concentrated on, but it's nothing expression of his soul. You immediately find that. When it has come from his soul, then you know it carries another illumination, another power altogether different because it influences some deeper part of yourself. You see, it contacts somewhere uh, in the inmost being. Well, the lower nature's movement are defective and ignorant and full of mixtures. And they therefore require the help of the psychic being for transforming them into, well, more perfect instruments. For instance, in the mind, the distinction between truth and falsehood, right and wrong, what should be done and what should not be done, very difficult. Because mind is weighed by, you know, uh, outer considerations and looks at things from outside. 
But suppose, in, imagine a man who has got a psyche being awake. Well, for him it's not at all difficult. It is almost instantaneous, instantaneous. He may not be able to give you a reason for it, but he doesn't take, him, take time to decide. Immediately the decision is there. And in 99.9 .9 cases it is correct. You might find it afterwards that it is correct. If immediately you find that he is wrong, well, after some time you might find that it is right. That is a psychic way of deciding. So that the powers which the other instrumental nature has got, mind and vital being or emotional being, the psychic being has got those powers in a much more, you know, intensified form and with a more effective, uh, you know, effective working or dynamics. The lower nature's movement are defective and um, the distinction between truth and falsehood or right and wrong or what should or should not be done becomes easy when the psychic being is awake. And this psychic being is not deceived by appearances. You see, it is uh, to a man who is uh, always governed by, you know, outer signs, it might be easy uh, either to deceive him or for him to get deceived. Because he looks for outer signs. But the psychic being is not deceived. It knows at once. You get an imposter, you see, one who claims more than he is, so to say. And uh, you will find that seven or six out of ten people will be deceived. Because they have not that awakened soul consciousness in them. But a man psychically awake will never be deceived. He will know immediately that it's hollow. This is very simple. This discrimination doesn't come by intellectual you know, process of reasoning out. No, it is like that spontaneous, intuitive. And the intuitive intuition of the psychic being is 99.9 correct. And that is why children sometimes and women are very correct in their estimation of things without reasoning. They can't reason out why you say like that. They, they can't say why. But uh, what they say is right. It is very correct very often, you see, because there, there is some, it's not mind that is working, it is a feeling and that, that part we decide is influenced by that soul entity and when that acts, well, it is, it is a hit to the truth, it is a hit to the truth, well, that is, there is, there is a way in which it works generally in the, in the human consciousness. Now, it is not carried away by falsehood and appearances. And the power of psychic being in its essential divinity or in the divine is something unshakable. It's more than a rock. And supposing man's psychic being is awake and the whole world tells him that there is no God. It will have no effect on him at all. <laughs> it will have no effect on him at all. He, he wouldn't bother to argue about it, but uh, he, it wouldn't go at all into, you know, wouldn't enter any part of his being, because something in him, you know, would, uh, let's see, it refuses to believe in spite of the whole world. It only says, well, I know, and that's the end of the matter. <laughs> it doesn't say argument why, say I know. That's how the psychic being acts. It doesn't act with the ratio of the and thinking because therefore an eye is nothing of the kind. An assertion of a mean side, I know, and that's enough to meet all negation of the whole world. Well, the psychic being is not, well, that is one. Now, we, before we proceed, we will not to know when you do in sadhana, what is the sign of its awakening? First is that... Uh, you grow conscious of your own self. Apart from mind and apart from life, you grow conscious of an entity that you are. True being or true soul. A greater awareness of self. You do not identify then yourself with your mind or mental activity, your vital or with your life activity, desires or impulses or ideas or thoughts. You see, these are all right. They are my instrument, but they are not yourself. And you get the true devotion for God. When the psyche being awakens, then the true devotion for the divine comes to the nature part. You see, true devotion in the sense of, well, there being no compromise or bargain in devotion. People, even when they devote, 
you must remember that in devotion there is plenty of reservations you see we, there is always an arrière pensée as they, they say in french you see a reservation when the thing is done and conditional you know devotion also is there and compromise in the act of surrender or devotion also is there and uh, there is a sort of thing that of course i adore the divine or i devote myself to the divine but then the divine must make me great or must give me power or must give me a great success in life and so on so on that also is understood sometimes well except when the psyche being awake then you have the devotion for the sake of devotion you are devoted to the divine for the sake of the divine there is no then you know it is called ahaitugi bhakti you see motiveless devotion that is the power of the psychic being well that is um, yes and um, because it is in contact with the divine and behind nature devotion without motive and without reservation becomes possible it can surrender itself truly to the divine and obey also the truth in the right way because it gives truly it also receives truly from the divine and the one characteristic of the psyche being is that it always asks for the truth for the light for the divine it never asks for anything else there's a characteristic how to know the functioning or working of the psychic being well there are some signs which the uh, letters of shri anu give you that it always asks for always wants and asks for the truth the divine and um, if any part of nature follows anything else egoistically the psychic being feels sad depressed it is not vital depression no it is different from uh, you know vital depression which comes because desire or some impulse is not satisfied no when some part of the nature is making a fool of itself so to say and pursuing some egoistic motive mind is running in the direction of greatness vital is running in the desire of you know fulfillment of ambition or ego or possession or something and if the psychic being has been touched it feels very sad in the sense that well this part of myself is making a fool of itself you see that's just like that and uh, it it always feels very sad that a uh, certain part of its own you know government so to say is not carrying out its policy something like that you see and it feels very that sadness should really end not in depression but in awakening a higher aspiration that sadness must ultimately change the part of nature which is recalcitrant which is disobedient or which is working on its own basis you see the result of such sadness should not be weakness and depression but it must go to a greater will to impose on that part of nature the direction of turning to the truth the impulse to turn to light but the result must be that it must govern that part which is not uh, under its uh, well uh, control and uh, because psyche being now in the description that we give looks as if it is a very very delicate and soft part of man's nature it is not true psyche being or the soul in man the soul entity or the divine spark is not soft and delicate only it is not weak and inert the presiding deity of the psychic plane is fire a fire of aspiration and it is a divine fire of aspiration and even if the whole being is full of impurity it is this fire that is capable of consuming all impurities so if nature is impure one is not to feel Uh, as if uh, you know um, pessimistic about it that oh my nature is full of impurity what can i do no there is a psychic being in all there is no one without the divine spark and the presiding deity of that plane and that being is fire and when psychic being awakens it awakens with that fire it awakens with this fire of aspiration and it is this fire of aspiration that can burn all impurities of human nature so 
well that gives roughly some idea of the psychic being and its place in uh, men's uh, psychology so far as our yogic life is concerned and uh, i wanted now to deal with the practical aspect of sadhana because we are not studying psychology for the sake of academic interest you see we take uh, a general view of current schools and and all ideas and you know the the metaphysics of it just in order to uh, to place ourselves into a position of deciding and knowing that we are not going in for anything obscure or irrational or superstitious that we know what we are doing and we understand um, the, the 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 structure of man to some extent and we even can claim there is plenty of experimental material on which our knowledge is based it is not as if nobody had done anything and suddenly a belief is given to us to start with and say look i am authority now accept this and you start not at all somebody who has done and thousands of people for hundreds of years did tapasya yogic life and from the generalization a tradition is built up on that tradition great personalities even now in india have come to light and out of them sherundo had the intellectual capacity and comprehensiveness to take up all those and organize into a system acceptable understandable and rationally presentable to the modern mind that's all but it is absolutely one of the most tremendously experimented science upon which we are basing ourselves apart from past traditional experiments of thousands of people over hundreds of years sri arundo himself went in for this experiment for more than 40 years on himself and with about 1000 people so it is a result of well, experimental research carried out with uh, with a scrupulous care more care than a scientist bestows on his laboratory did i not read that sentence that if we had not thousands and thousands of yes evidences we would not speak of it as we do that was a sentence if you remember i quoted it from his one of his letters so that it is done with the scrupulousness of a scientist only it's a science of a different order it's not a material science and therefore it deals with uh, the material in a different way now we have arrived at a general knowledge of man's constitution internally and externally and we are now in a position to start if we have the aspiration to do the yoga first condition is voluntary it is not you cannot impose yoga on anyone yoga cannot be taught like a subject in a school yoga has to be chosen voluntarily by man's free will he must want to progress in the line of growth of his consciousness well then he can begin otherwise yoga is not possible now with this knowledge it is possible for someone to start his yogic practice now in the practice of yoga you put first of all the aim before yourself the aim is that you accept the great intuition that has come down to humanity from times of its historical existence that there is a truth there is a reality which is supra physical supra intellectual you can say supra sensual the 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 medicine man and the and the you see the the men of the tribe in africa also felt the presence of something which he called you know by incantation he tried to contact it and so on whatever the 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 rough way of doing it the the conception or the intuition of a power which is beyond the range of senses or mind is there with humanity we start with that that yes there is a truth we have been following the rational of it in our life divine studies in life divine we have come to a to the chapter where we have found rationally the position of an omnipresent reality established i mean without any any difficulty it is easily established that this existence which we see infinite existence outside ourselves is the expression of an omnipresent reality that there is an infinite existence you do not require any proof i suppose every human being when he turns his eyes outward knows that outside him things exist stones are there rivers are there mountains are mountains are there water is there well uh, it it all is it exists and that existence is infinite yes that existence outside is an infinite existence well behind this infinite existence you can say that this existence that we see the infinite around us 
is the expression of an omnipresent reality. That reality which we see differentiated and divided and classified into so many classes and in each class again divided into objects which seem to be individualized, separated and divided, nevertheless possesses one and the same reality, an omnipresent reality. The reality is the same and that reality is supra-intellectual, supra-physical, supra-sensual. Well, that's how we want to start. And the object in the yoga is not really to identify ourselves with that. That is the first process to ascend or to rise and identify. And then secondly, to bring it down into life, into nature, so that life on earth might be able to, well, um, give expression to another mold of, uh, of life here. It might be possible to, well, uh, reach a fulfillment which has been promised by all religions as the coming of what they call the golden age. The golden age is not outside. The golden age is the living of an inner truth and governing the outer most life by that inner truth. And that one man can live in golden age when the whole world is in the iron age. Golden age, uh, yes, the whole world might be in iron age. It doesn't matter. For one who can live this truth, well, he is living in the golden age. It's not necessary for uh, for the whole world to change, you know, in order for oneself to oneself to realize the golden age. No, it depends on one's own inner consciousness. So, effort is to reach that truth beyond intellect, mind, and body and life, and to bring it down after reaching into life to the extent that it is given to us. You see, all need not uh, rise to the same height because height and and uh, want of height are human conceptions. Truth is truth, whether manifested in a small, uh, you know, organism or manifested in a big organism. It is not quantity, it is quality. And truth quality is the same wherever it manifests in a small man or in a, in a big personality. In a big personality, the measure of the divine is not more. In a small personality, the measure of the divine is not less. That is why Milton, I think, wrote is not not. Yes, I think it was Milton. Thousands at his bidding hmm, run over earth and sky or space and sky. They also serve who only stand and wait. The angels, by, in the order of the Supreme, thousands on his bidding, you know, speed over earth and sky or heaven. And they also serve the divine. They, they do it only to carry out the order of the divine. Well, they also serve who only stand and wait. You see, it's not that uh, work is only, it's not to be measured, it's quantity, quality. So, there is no great and small divinity or truth or reality or supreme light. Is supreme light whether it is on, a, on what man thinks as a pinpoint or a sun. It's, it doesn't make much difference because it is that. And effort to bring that requires a voluntary choice because as he puts it in his letters, the divine guides but does not drive. He gives you the full measure of help if you want, but he is no driver of man. And that's why when I went to Tahoe, I told the boys, one of the, they had prepared a questionnaire, you see, print type questionnaire. And uh, Chuck told me not to take it seriously. He said, these are boys, they do like that. They always put very big question to appear that they are very busy with great questions and so on. They are not at all. They like to play more and enjoy life here. And they are for an outing and picnic and so on. I said, that's all right. But why should they have touched this question at all? So I will take it up, I said. <laughs> Only I won't deal, it, deal with it very seriously and at length. And one of the questions was, what is God? <laughs> Which was very, uh, there are 20 questions like that. So I said, look, each question requires a lifetime. It's no job. <laughs> and you young fellow, have decent question. All right, so I won't answer you, but I'll give you material to think over. That's all. I won't answer this question because each answer will require one life. And that too, you may not be able to solve. So then, so I said, here is the question, what is God? Well, I said, I give one definition, God is the greatest democrat I have ever known. <laughs> greatest democrat I have ever known. Why? Because he never imposes himself on anyone. Never imposes himself on anyone. You have to vote. 
you vote for him well then because you have chosen him well he intervenes if you don't choose him well he is he is not interested in, in making himself felt by force no not at all then he said yes i said well god is the reality by which you are able to put the question what is god there was second answer i gave them. said god is that reality by which you are enabled to put the question what is god the third i gave i said all right one i remember now and that is god is an eternal child playing an eternal game in an eternal garden he said oh, John, i had a hearty laugh over it <laughs> but the first made them think that was no doubt about it i see the greatest democrat first thing he never interferes with you till you choose him you give vote to him then he says all right now you have chosen me well then i am your elect and then i will see to it that you go my way because you have chosen me yes so this voluntary decision on the part of man to attain or make an attempt to attain a higher reality is something so deeply implanted in the constitution of man that that thirst or that aspiration has persisted from the beginning of human history right up to now and it has done work it is not as it were it was futile or it was only a superstitious belief this belief in something greater than uh, ex external existence or outer being of man or the animal existence has been creative of culture you take your poetry take philosophy take arts and if you take out this belief from that you will see it become immediately impoverished so that uh, it has it has created architectures it has dealt with matter so don't think it has simply in the air man has been only superstitiously you know uh, i mean busy with abstractions which are like clouds or smoke or you know weaving of mind it has affected life it has created cultures it has affected well uh, stocks and stones and building poetry painting and arts so it has it has given rise to an aspect of culture i don't say all culture you need not identify but it is a very important part of human culture and that owes its origin to man's effort to reach this reality however imperfect is uh, his success in reaching may be the effort has been there all through and now has come perhaps a time when he might make an effort with greater chance of success so the effort is to bring into existence that reality in ourselves first by making an aspiration the first priority of our life that i have already dealt with in one of my talks one evening so i will not repeat that if yoga is to be done the basis of it is a voluntary decision of the human individual that he must choose to want to practice yoga one and the conditions are aspiration rejection and surrender that we have done already so i will not take up uh, you know time and developing those aspects because that we are take for granted that you understand that aspiration rejection and surrender one or two points i can or may deal with here and one is the place of a guru because in all yoga generally indian tradition and even western tradition requires the presence of a guru well in this yoga also there is a presence of a guru and this is what he wrote in one of his letters to a disciple guru in this yoga i may for the sake of convenience consent to be called a guru but that there is no guru in this yoga as people ordinarily understand the term as people ordinarily understand the term it is the higher power that is coming down that is really the guru yes but generally when such higher force comes down then it prepares an instrument who discovers but really speaking to whom the truth is discovered and it manifests itself in him in proportion to his well power of receptivity there too the power is given to him when the power that is coming down prepares one such instrument it becomes easy for it to come down into others who want to manifest it who do not want to go their own way but want to have want to have the truth and live the truth and then he pointed to himself it was in an evening sitting and so he said well there is the instrument 
means pointing to himself, but that is the instrument. And you can take it as much as you like from the instrument. This yoga means growing conscious every moment of what is going on in, uh, in oneself. One has to give consent to the higher working, rejecting the lower movement every time. One cannot leave the burden of his yoga entirely to the guru in this yoga. It is very clear. So, uh, well, that is uh, one portion cleared of, uh, of uh, the, the position of the guru so far as it concerned. And there are some people who have an idea that perhaps for the Europeans, this yoga is not uh, being oriental, they will say, you know, uh, perhaps the European mind is, uh, because uh, they, are no, they are not oriental in their nature, they are incapable of practicing this yoga. There are some people who believe that, at least one man wrote to him like that, you see, and uh, uh, now, fortunately, there are very few people who believe it, I said. But Sierra wrote about it in one of his letters, that Europeans throughout the centuries have practiced with success spiritual disciplines, which are akin to Oriental Yoga, and have followed ways of inner life which came to them from the East. So that did not prevent them from practicing Yoga. There is no uh, Eastern and Western mind in the practice of Yoga. <laughs> The approach and experiences of Plotinus and the European mystics who derived from him were identical with the approach and experiences of one type of Indian yoga. Especially since the introduction of Christianity, Europeans have followed its mystic disciplines which were, which were and are in a sense one with those of Asia, however much they may have differed in form, name or symbols. So, yoga was not quite an unknown quantity to European mentality. The Greeks, the Scythians from the West, and the Japanese and the Chinese and the Cambodians from the East did follow without difficulty the Buddhist and the Hindu discipline. So, it didn't require an Oriental mentality to, to practice the yoga. You see, there is no essential difference between the spiritual life in the East and spiritual life in the West. I'm quoting him so as to tell you how he always looked upon uh, the yoga as, a, well, a natural, you know, field of attempt of the human being, whether he belonged to the East or the West, did not matter. I knew very well Sister Nivedita. Somebody wrote to him that, you see, Europeans, when they adapt, take up yoga, have to become Indian in temperament. He said, not at all. He gives the instance from his own life. I knew Sister Nivedita for many years a fr as a friend and a comrade in the political work and met Sister Christine. Christine. How do you pronounce Christine? Christine. Christine, yes. The two closest disciples of Vivekananda. Both of them were Westerners to the core and had nothing of the Hindu outlook at all. And yet, both of them found no difficulty in arriving at realization on the Vedantic Yoga. It is not the Hindu outlook or the Western outlook that fundamentally matters in Yoga, but the psychic turn and the spiritual urge. These are the same everywhere. Whether it is here or <laughs> whether it is in the North Pole, <laughs> the urge to spiritual life is the same. It doesn't make any difference. Then he recounts some difficulties of the ox o uh, Occidental mind. Then at last he concluded that writing by saying, we are not working for a race or a people or a continent or for a realization, for the realization of which only Indians or only Orientals are capable. Our aim is not either to found a religion or a school of philosophy or a school of yoga, but to create a ground of spiritual growth and experience and a way which will bring down a greater truth beyond the mind but which is not inaccessible to the human soul and human consciousness. All can pass who are drawn to that truth, whether they are from India or elsewhere, from East or from the West. All may find great difficulties in their personal and common human nature, but it is not their physical origin or their racial temperament that can be an insuperable obstacle in their yoga. So you see, there I have tried to give you also in his own words, 
the attitude that it is a yoga meant for the present day humanity it's really speaking not a yoga to be confined to oriental attitude or oriental mind it is something that is to meet the need of humanity today and i think we'll close here now for the time because the rest if i take up then it will be incomplete and then you won't be able to go through but at begin tomorrow that part of the now because it will touch more the practical side of yoga we will take up the the aspect of yogic life because that is more important for us bothering about psychological theories is not necessary at all we try to tackle the problem of our own selves and try to see what we can do some days we might reserve for uh, questions one or two days i mean questions of practical nature not of theoretical type but practical type if there are any okay that we shall see after the main portion is covered it might take us about how many we are covered eight lectures no yes this is the eight uh, yes seventh or eighth yes so it might be after 10th or 12th or 15th 10th or 12th or 15th that we might be able to uh, give a little you know please your time to or to be able to precipitate their difficulties or their questions you see that would be all right this is actually the 16th lecture you count uh, morning and evening right yeah no yes that is but that two subjects one is life divine yeah. and yes yeah, so <laughs> this is actually the, the sixth lecture of the sixth on on psychology psychology yes yeah, that's what it is this <clears throat> we have eight Yes. And yes. On the last night. Yes. The new, the new idea in India, the traditional idea is more for an outer guru, isn't it, and not for the inner truth as the guru. Yes. No, the guru's place. He finds out that you can take help from him as the representative of the higher power. Yes. that is the guru yes the guru is within you and if any outside representative is found he is representative of the higher power for you it's not a person of the guru that is important no uh, it is his instrumentality to a higher consciousness which is important and to you he represents or he impersonizes or he is the embodiment of that truth which you are seeking you see it is uh, the western mind finds it sometimes difficult to conceive the the way in which india easily looks upon the guru because guru to them is representative of the divine and to the west the divine must be some very far off otherwise it's not divine you see that is some idea like that it must be very far otherwise how can it be divine that is the fear i understand the point i quite quite understand how they look at it and i know the difficulty in adapting a new attitude to that but for from the point of view of indian they say that yes that is there but then we want here now today in present condition somebody in whom we can say well if i want to be perfect how would he be like then you say somebody oh i would like to be like him well then he represents to you the, the divine for the time being you see that is the divine because your highest idea of perfection conception of perfection is, is fulfilled in somebody well then to him to you he symbolizes or him for he is the embodiment of the divine he is represents the divine because uh, it, is, it is that is that is the way the current comes you see the current is passed as he said that the one who is first made the instrument or chosen as the instrument well makes it possible for other to receive the same current and you can receive from the same instrument it is equally possible for one to to make a direct contact but if there is already an easy contact we immediately do it like that otherwise you have to build up your line well of course you can no doubt <laughs> yes yeah a person is making contact with the wrong power hmm although they have a desire to make a contact with the right power do they make contact with the wrong power if they only desire they can it depends upon the purity of motive and the pure aspiration because people can want to aspire or i mean desire contact with the higher power to satisfy ego or ambition and in that case nine cases out of 10 they will go wrong 
they will go wrong. I have seen that case. I am telling you from my actual experience that if they proceed in the process of inner life to contact a higher truth with some ambition, with the desire to satisfy ego, just as a man acquires money, this is in the material world, that is in the spiritual world, but with a very similar attitude, 9 out of 10, they will go wrong. Because there are powers in the subtle world, if you want an explanation, there are powers who are only waiting to vele, as they say, you see, and uh, to, to promise fulfillment of the ambition and simply pull the man away at a tangent from the right path. They are very conscious, they are not unconscious. That is why in yogic life, uh, in any yoga, true yoga, I mean, they always insist on purity of motive, purity of aspiration, no desires, no ambition, only aspiration. And surrender as one of the main planks because by giving yourself up to a higher truth only, the truth is able to work on you. If you give yourself up to your vital egoism or ambition, then you give yourself up to vital powers. Who can promise some, you know, I mean, limited fulfillment? but who also can ruin entirely your spiritual life. I mean, spiritual life is, is gone for, for at least one life, if not more, for such men. Because once they clutch, they, they catch hold, oh, it's very difficult to get out. So ignorance is like that. <laughs> You mean these powers are not in the person, you mean? Yes, yeah, they are, they are in the, on the subtle planes. On the subtle planes? Mainly on the vital planes, mainly. Okay. But they are also on the mental plane. Powers of darkness, you see. Powers of ignorance who are conscious. Conscious beings, you can say, without any difficulty. And their, their business is to promise fulfillment and ambition to anyone. Who wants fulfillment and then? Because their business is not to allow the human being to open to light. Because that happens, their reign here will be disturbed, you see. Now the major portion of human being is under the governance of vital powers. Indirectly governed through human ignorance, of course. Men are not possessed by them directly, no. But because men are ignorant, those powers are able to penetrate the human being with their impulses. And uh, so much of the human belt, so the life belt is under their clutch. And anything of the light will, will be their defeat, so to say, you see. They will be compelled to give up that realm and then they fight to the last ditch. They fight to the last ditch. Oh. They never, never come forward. This is why a higher power is the only thing. Hey. Yes, that is, you only depend upon the help of the Supreme Light, the Divine, you know, Truth. You depend on the Truth for, for progress in life. And you want only the Truth for its own sake. And bring it down in life to fulfill its will in your life or His will in your life. The aim of Yoga is not to attain a power, but to bring the illumination, light and harmony and, and uh, consciousness of the Supreme, so that His will in life may be fulfilled in us. That's all. And that has to be repeatedly told the, the consciousness because once one it almost thinks that now that he has greater powers, perhaps he might do something for somebody or mankind or himself and, and so on, which is just another form of ambition and egoism. And against that one has to guard. <laughs>